Welcome back to r slash just no HOA, where people share stories about their crazy homeowner associations that make us feel better about not living in an HOA. And in case you are new around here, please don't forget to subscribe to the channel to join our awesome community. Without any further ado, let's dive right into the stories. The first one is titled HOA evicted me and sold my house. I will never be living in a neighborhood with an HOA ever again. Their bizarre rules and expectations are absolutely asinine. Plus the fact that they can just foreclose on your home if you don't pay them their stupid dues is crazy. Well, that is what happened to me at least. My whole life I have suffered from anxiety and other health problems, I was simply cursed with having a bad immune system. I rarely leave my house or interact with people outside of my family and closest friends and I have a majority of my mail sent to me electronically. I don't like to be wasteful and have paper bills. I bought my house almost 20 years ago, it was a great investment at the time because the market was cheap and it didn't take me long to have it paid off. When I purchased my house it was the very beginning of the construction of the neighborhood and there was no HOA. About 6 years ago I developed multiple sclerosis which is debilitating and incredibly difficult to manage, especially at first. I started having to take medications that suppressed my immune system and made me prone to being very sick. I was more or less homebound at that point and I did not receive any US mail for several years. At this point my friendly neighbors also advised me to join the HOA because they might make the neighborhood safer and could help me out eventually. Since my neighbors also joined the HOA I did not want to be the odd one out and thus followed the advice of my niece and joined them. Things seemed normal until one day they weren't. I received a letter on my door first, it was taped on and said that we had been evicted and that the HOA sold my home at an auction because of unpaid HOA dues to an investment company. My first thought was that this was just a mistake. How could this happen? I never knew anything was going on with my house, let alone it being sold from underneath me. On the second page of this foreclosure notice was another note from the HOA. They were saying that I owed them thousands of dollars over the last 5 years. I wasn't sure what to do, in the past my friend helped me set up my HOA account for automatic payment, so I thought they were always paid without me doing anything. The number they wanted was crazy, some $19,000 is what they sold my house for, stating that is what it was worth and what I owed them. Again, my mind was spinning. I simply had a hard time with my MS and the shock of it all, how was I going to handle this? The notice said that I had two days to move out, two whole days to pack up my house that I've lived in for over a decade. I called my brother-in-law who was a retired lawyer and consulted with him about what I should do. Thankfully Gerald, brother-in-law, said that he still had his license and that he would come out of retirement to help me. He gathered what evidence I could provide him while he set up an appeal with the investment company, the HOA and the court. He said that I have the right to fight them and appeal everything and that is what we needed to do to fight them. After the two days were up, there were men there to move my belongings and sent me packing. It was heart-wrenching, watching them put all of my stuff in a truck haphazardly, no respect for an old woman and her stuff. Gerald reassured me and said that this would happen though, as we simply did not have the time to defend it before they evicted me. We were still hopeful that I would win the house back though. I did not have a great defense besides my medical history and that is what Gerald was going to use to try and win this case. He said that the fact that I didn't receive any mail stating that I failed to make HOA payments nor did they give me any warning emails or letters before doing the foreclosure that we should have a decent chance. We were hopeful but I was not going to assume anything. Years of always being sick and unfortunate made me a pessimist after all. While we were waiting on lawyers and a court date, I had family, friends and neighbors sending emails and letters to the HOA asking them to have sympathy for me. I was not too proud of it but I felt like if it would help then why not try. 
They explained how I was sick for years and never received the letters in the mail. That I should be exempt from their rules since I had lived there longer than the HOA itself. So many things were sent in and all of them were ignored. These people have no care or sympathy for anything other than their own lives and agendas. I was staying with family for the time being, but they didn't have much room and I felt terrible for encroaching upon their home and lives. Thankfully they were lovely and thoughtful and were happy to help me. It took almost a month to get a court date, I was starting to worry that they may sell my home to someone else again before I could hopefully win it back. There were so many things that were running through my head and I was more stressed out than I had been in probably my entire life. The time finally came and it was the moment I had been excited and stressed out about for over a month. The HOA was there and so was the lawyer for the investment company that the home was sold to. They went first, their points were all unfortunately valid, I honestly did feel bad for not realizing that I failed to pay HOA dues. I don't know how I can possibly win, but Gerald kept saying to have faith and that he would try to use the judge's sympathy in my favor. Somehow Gerald was right. He talked about my past, my life, my medical history and how the last six years have been the worst for me. He said that they had not gone through extra steps to ensure that I was receiving my letters and my dues. That the HOA had ample opportunity to talk to me and make sure that I knew what was going on. He said that it is also part of their responsibility to make sure that homeowners know when they are behind on dues. The judge ruled that my debilitating medical situation created circumstances of excusable neglect and that there was justification to relieve me from the operation of the default judgment. The court made very clear that the law in this situation is not necessarily crystal clear, but the outcome and what the right thing to have occurred is extremely clear. The judge also denied the HOA's request for $35,000 in attorney fees and the HOA guys were absolutely fuming and the investment company was pissed off. The HOA far more than the investment company though. They continued to argue and said that they at least wanted me to pay their thousands of dollars of legal fees. The judge laughed and said that they were gorging me and dismissed their claims again. The one unfortunate thing is that I do have to pay back the $19,000 that my house was sold to to the investment company for, which really stinks. It was almost like paying for the home all over again, but hey, it's well worth being back in my own house. Well, for now at least. I'm going to sell the house for way more than $19,000 and then move. I don't want to be part of this HOA anymore, paying them their stupid dues is not worth the hassle, but for now I have my home until I find the next one. With no HOA. And yeah ripe stars, that is just a shocking thing about HOAs, they pretend to be the people that make the neighborhood a better place, but then when you see them, especially in court, how merciless and ruthless they can be, I really have my doubts about how they make the neighborhood a better place. In a so-called good neighborhood, shouldn't there be at least a glimpse of empathy? Apparently not when it comes to HOA managements. Either way, if you enjoy the stories about crazy HOAs, then please don't forget to like the video if you want to support my channel. Thank you so much in advance, your support means the world to me and it helps me tremendously. And the next one was posted on r slash ripe stories by the beloved and talented Love Buckhucks and it is titled Women's Work. Let's all climb into the time machine and take a magical mystical ride back to yesteryear. All the way back to 1977, it was a good year. My girlfriend Autumn and I had just graduated university that spring and she talked me into joining this new and interesting health and rescue unit that was being set up to go worldwide soon. I thought, why not? I was young, intelligent enough to pass a block test and eager to make my mark on this planet. Now, my boyfriend was angry at my decision even after discussing all the pros and cons with him, I explained to him he was so busy beating pig or cowskin balls around a man-made diamond to the cheers of the masses. And guys, maybe I'm dumb or something, but what kind of sport is that? I was wrapping my head around that for the last few minutes and I just cannot figure it out. If you know what kind of sport OP is talking about, please let me know in the comments. 
Anyway, he and his playmates would then strut around like peacocks in full regalia, petting each other's booties, very manly I assure you, my dear readers. And please don't get me started on a bunch of men sitting or standing around chewing their cut and spitting cut lodgies everywhere. I then explained how he disappears for months on end every year, strutting, petting and spitting on someone else's faux diamond, and I could spend that time out making my own marks. He asked me what was so wrong with staying home to do my womanly duties, I then had a staring match with him that lasted an eternity, in my mind his hair was graying, his skin was wrinkling and he was shriveled into a crook geriatric old geezer, but he broke our mini WW3 by a week, well... I replied that I had only be gone 6 to 8 weeks at a time, you won't even notice I'm gone. I made a mental note to find the man who started that nonsense, women should stay barefoot and pregnant and women's work must be done by women. Hogtie him and tar and feather him and then leave him in the center of town with a sign posted next to him saying women's work at its best. Now Autumn's husband was a third generation military man and understood our need to stretch our desires to go where no woman has gone before. So there we were, a group of greenhorns who didn't know what kind of hell on earth we were about to climb into. Our class was made up of 21 females and 49 males. There we sat in an auditorium on a military base, listening to explanations of what was expected of us. All of these explanations were thrown at us in military fashion and pace. It felt so similar to taking state's nursing boards, that feeling of having the top of my head screwed off and having someone squish around in my grey matter. We were dismissed to the mess hall, dazed and confused. They said join this specific unit, they said. They said it will be great, they said. They said you will be rendering aid to your fellow man in need, they said. They said, and you will travel the world and learn through action, they said. Yep, they said it. So there we were trying to eat and keep it all down, pondering our eminent demise. Or committing, <clears throat> ending your own life, by ringing that bell. The next morning started before the sun broke ground, one and a half miles, two and a half kilometers, thank you for that by the way, run with occasional puking and dry heaving, followed by calisthenics. Very fun. By the end of the first week our barracks sounded like bone cancer patients resided in them. The whining and groaning could be heard all the way to mess hall and the vapors from various brands of muscle cramp and pain creams could make the eyes of passers-by well up in tears. We were a pathetic collection of seemingly masochistic idiots with delusions of grandeur that we had a real chance of finishing this camp of terror and torture and make huge marks in this world. But aren't we all allowed to dream and make believe? Funny how wherever one goes within this camp, one somehow always seems to walk by or near to that bell. That damn bell that seemed to entice anyone who dared to gaze upon it as if to say, ring me, I will end your suffering. Ring me, it is so easy to do, just pick up the bat and give me a whack, it is easy to do. After morning mess hall, those who dared, we had classes. We studied countries, social norms for each country, languages, weather charting, mapping, self-defense, evasion and concealment, search and rescue, medical skills training, parachute training, weaponry care and instruction, military communication skills, etc. A lot of riveting things we never knew we needed to know. Fun as well. So there we all were, a gaggle of miscreant greenhorns out on the shooting range to practice your life preserving skills in person. Autumn and I stayed in the back of the line to watch our fellow mates play a one way western cowboy shoot em up show. They did 5 greenhorns at a time. The quieted snickers from the boys of steel were deflating us, snicker by snicker, when we were up, Autumn whispered to me, let's show them how it's done. She gave her I and I shook my head affirmatively. The last five of us, we took our weapons, our ammo and took up our positions on the ground next to our assigned training buddies. They called out the all clear and then go live fire. We shot, Autumn and I pulled a 10 of 10. Gunny Sergeant called us out as showing off and ordered us to shoot 10 more. 10 out of 10 at 100 yard mark. Give me 250, he yelled. Targets were set at 250 yards, 10 out of 10 at 250. Give me 500, he barked. 
10 out of 10 at 500. 1000, he screamed. And yes, 10 out of 10 at 1000 yards. Give me 1.5 kilometers, give me at least 3 of 10. Autumn smiled at me, winked and then refocused after reloading. She pulled a 6 out of 10 while I pulled a 9 out of 10. Gunny Sergeant yelled, woohoo, what we have here is a couple of hot shots. And then everyone started in with woos. It felt like a carnival game where one wins a prize for shooting the little yellow metal duckie's head. Autumn and I took a bow and Gunny Sergeant yelled, a 10 hut. Gunny Sergeant called Autumn and I into a meeting with some base brass. We were asked about what skill sets we actually had, they questioned us in disbelief. We were made to tear down and rebuild several types of weaponry, had us break down and clean a piece and then rebuild it. They even had us climb into a couple tanks and we had to navigate them over their mock-up war zone. Now, dear readers, this was fun. We climbed down a small rabbit hole into a steel can that smelled like gasoline, burnt gunpowder, dirty feet, boiled moldy cabbage and gear oil. Fun. Then you have to manipulate pedals, shifters and gamer sticks complete with buttons and don't forget all the cute toggle switches. And also your windshield consists of a periscope. Are we having fun yet? Well, ripe stars, that sounds to me like type 3 fun. Please let me know in the comments if you get that reference. I would really be surprised. Now, Autumn had her pilot's license and had her helicopter certification. So there we were, watching Autumn do several touch and goes, spins and go fetches. She was showing off, God bless her. She landed her kits on the two tanks that were parked next to each other, turned the chopper off and climbed down, did her oh so typical put your booty in the air like you just don't care duck walk under the still spinning blades and yelled I couldn't help it, I just couldn't help it as she snickered. She got yelled at for the stunt she pulled and then was told well done. Autumn and I sped through parachute training, we face jumped and parachuted for fun. Evasion and concealment, search and rescue was fun. We got to dress up as portly aggressors and the rest of us got to pretend to be marines. We had the privilege to beat the ever-loving snot out of each other. Mental note was made to purchase a portly suit for precious boyfriend for the next time he dares to bring up women's work. We got to play in mud puddles, pretend we were earthworms and wriggle under barbed wire and mud with live fire going off over us. We got to play war in a pretend town using paintball ammo and then we had the chance to free captured mates without getting caught ourselves. It was great fun and I believe we all learned a lot. Medical training was a breeze for Autumn and I. We both had masters in nursing but we noted the military did things somewhat differently here and there. Weather charting and surveillance mapping was fun, truthfully, both challenging and interesting. I likened it to statistics, notoriously the most hated course at any university. But self-defense class was a hoot and a half in a hauler and then some. We got to beat each other up again, punch kick and throw each other, we were padded but still. Mental note made to buy a self-defense practice suit for boyfriend as they were less padded than the evasion slash rescue suits. Wink wink. So there we were, the lucky 42 who survived the last 16 weeks. We graduated but we were still greenhorns. We were assigned to our units and given our first assignments to go into the world and make our marks. And remember folks, high, tight and to the right. South Korea, here we come. I will close this segment of remembrance with a few personal thoughts. Never tell yourself I cannot, you can never truly know unless you try at least once. When you face seemingly insurmountable challenges, give yourself permission to quit tomorrow if you force yourself to finish today. Funny how tomorrow never comes. After a night's sleep you will meet your new day, proud you finished yesterday, so you will quit tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. When faced with overwhelmingly massive amounts of objectives you are expected to complete, don't think about all of them at once, attack them little at a time. All of a sudden you will find you're almost done and they were not so overwhelming after all. Postscript, the training we received was not SEAL training, it was however training we needed because we were going to be dropped into third world countries, some post-war, where all sorts of dangers posed major risks to our health and safety. Our abilities to fight off clear threats were a must. 
Since our escorts are military personnel, it was imperative that we were always on the same page as our escorts. Our very lives depended on it, we also had to prove our physical fitness to handle the external stresses we were about to deal with. I thank the military for their time, energy and frustrations as they endured training people who had absolutely no previous military experience or training whatsoever. The sheer fact that they did so well teaching us what we needed to know to survive in the short amount of time they did it in is pure testament to the strength, wisdom and power the military possesses. With my thanks and gratitude to them, I can honestly say they are the reason I lived through it all. Thank you for your service, your sacrifices, your valor, your commitment to God and the country. You are my heroes. God bless. And yeah, Ripe stars, what more can I say? Absolutely amazing story and as usual, perfectly written. Thank you so much for posting your amazing stories on r slash Ripe stories. And ripe stars, with this we have reached the end of the video, however, if you still cannot get enough of my content, then I would highly suggest to check out my endless binge watch playlist, which will soon show up in the left corner of the screen. In addition, I would really appreciate it if you could not only subscribe to the channel, but also turn on the bell notifications, which you can do by clicking on the little bell icon right next to the subscribe button. This will help my channel tremendously and this will make sure that you don't miss any of my videos. Furthermore, if you want to see additional ripe content that I don't post on YouTube, then I would suggest to head on over to patreon.com slash ripe YouTube for more than 50 50 exclusive videos that you will not see anywhere else. Thank you so much for your amazing daily support and I hope to see you again tomorrow.